So based on what we've studied so far, we should have a basic understanding of Mendelian genetics. But what we found is that the world isn't a simple place of dominant recessive. Now there are alternatives to that when we look at inheritance, but many of these things can still be explained um, by the rules that Mendel um, laid out in his original experiments. The ones that we're going to consider in this class that I want you to know uh, include incomplete dominance, codominance, when you have more than two alleles, what does that situation look like? Because right now we're just looking at purple or white, you know, or green or yellow, but what if you have purple, white, blue, red to pick from, different alleles? So how does that work out? Um, polygenic inheritance, uh, pleiotropy, sex-linked genes, and then finally multifactorial, inher multifactorial inheritance. So <clears throat> the first one we want to look at is incomplete dominance. So in this case, we're looking at carnations, and you have a red carnation, and you have pink carnations, and you have white carnations. And this kind of um, is an argument against dominance recessive, because you're like, oh, you um, breed a white carnation with a red carnation, you get a pink carnation. They're blending together. But in fact, that's not the case. This is the case of incomplete dominance. Because if it was a true blend, then you would take a pink carnation and a red carnation and get a dark pink carnation or a pink carnation, a white carnation, and get a very light pink carnation. And you don't get that. This is still now, you only see three phenotypes, red, pink, or white. Right? So how can the combination of genes create these um, phenotypic uh, patterns? Well, what you have here is incomplete dominance, meaning the heterozygote has a unique phenotype that is intermediary between the two homozygotes. Now we're going to have to use a slightly different uh, notation here because so far we've been showing that if something is dominant or recessive we use capital or lowercase letters. Well neither here is dominant or recessive. So we're just going to call the locus the flower color gene. So it's a big C for that locus, that gene. And then you have the versions of it as superscript. So you either have the color gene that's red, C, uh, R, or you have the color gene that's white, C, W. Now if you have two homozygous, well, they have to be homozygous because the red, the red plant must have two R genes and the white plant must have two white genes. They are going to make gametes, and the gametes only will have R from the red plant or W from the white plant. Now, when you mix them, you get a pink plant, and this is the heterozygote, right? So all the babies of a red and white cross will be pink. But if you self-cross the pink, now you have more options again. And you could get a gamete that's either red or white. And when you combine them all with a Punnett square, you can see that you get that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio that we pointed out earlier as a genotypic ratio. But that is the beauty of the incomplete dominance relationship. Because the genotype and the phenotype are all visible. right? So if it's red, you know what the genotype is. It's got to be RR. right? If it's pink, it's got to be RW. And if it's white, it's got to be WW. Right, so that actually makes incomplete dominant um, problems a little bit easier because there is no hidden genotype, right? as there was in a dominant recessive relationship. You could be big P, little P, or big P, big P, and um, you would still look the same. Right? So incomplete dominance is our first one. Now, the next variation is called codominance. And codominance is when both genes are expressed. So I'm not blending. I don't have an intermediate phenotype. Rather, I see both. So in this case, you would see a flower that is both white and red, right? as one example. Now, the classic example that we're going to use for both um, codominance and when you have more than two alleles is blood type. So let's take a look at blood type and consider it for um, codominance first. Now, blood type, you should know your blood type. If you don't, give blood and they'll tell you. But there are many, many markers proteins on blood cells. But the major typing proteins that we look at are A, B, um, and O. And so what we're going to see is that you can be A, you can be B, you could be AB, or O. And it's the AB that is our best example um, of a codominant relationship. You are both. Neither one is dominant, but we don't have an intermediate phenotype. We have both of them expressed. And so let's look at those red blood cells to kind of get a better feel for that. So again, the blood typing is simply naming a protein that you find 
there or not, or its absence um, on your red blood cells. So if you have blood type A, it means that you have that little green protein on your blood cells. If you have blood type B, it means you have that little blue triangle protein on your blood cells. If you have both A and B, if you're blood type AB, you have both. All right. So codominance means that both alleles are expressed. Now blood type O is neither. You have neither the A protein or the B protein. So what we have here then is actually three alleles at the locus for this protein. The A allele, the B allele, and the O allele. And we, when we look at that chart, we can look at the genotype. We're going to use both of those um, symbols to denote the genotype. So we're going to use capital I for idiotype. That's the fancy word for the protein profile in your blood. Um, for the dominant versions of the gene, and little i for the recessive, and O is recessive. So if I'm I, if I'm big I, I can be big I A version or big I B version. The other allele that's out there then is the little I version, and that results in blood type O. All right. So if you're blood type A, you could be homozygous, I big A or big I A big I A or big I A little I. Right, because the, as long as you have one version, the A, it's going to um, overshadow, it's going to dominate the little I, which is O, because O is the absence of the protein. Now, if you're B, you could be big B, big B, or you could be big B and then little I. If you're AB, remember you only have two slots, you have A and B, and that's it. Okay? And if you're O, you must have little I, little I. Right? So in this case, AB, the codominant, phenotype is known is a known genotype. O is a known genotype. If you're A or B, you could be either homozygous, dominant, or heterozygous. Right? We'll go over more examples in blood type um, in class and in lab. Like I said, these genetics problems, you just have to practice them, and we will. Now, the next um, alternative genetics that we see that still follows Mendel's rules is called polygenic inheritance. And skin tone, this is a simplified version of skin tone um, from a genetic point of view. But skin tone is a classic example. And this is, this is consistent with our understanding of the real world because it's like, oh, you know, the snapdragons, there's red and there's white and there's pink and that's it. But it's like, whoa, I've seen all, all kinds of characteristics that have a whole spectrum from one extreme to the other. Like, what's up with that? Well, what you have there is more than one locus contributing to the same trait. So, so far, we've looked at just one locus, meaning you've got two slots. You can fill one in from your dad, one in from your dad, for whatever alleles that they give you. Now, in this case, if it's polygenic, you actually have multiple loci contributing to the same um, characteristic or same trait. So, in this case, the A locus, the B locus, and the C locus, the genes on your chromosomes, they all contribute to skin tone. And each then has two slots that you can fill, one from mom, one from dad, of the two various alleles in the simplified version, a light allele and a dark allele. All right, so now all of a sudden you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different combinations, in essence, that creates a gradation or a spectrum of phenotypes from the lightest skin to the darkest skin. And based on the probability of mixing these, you get a bell curve of the lightest skin from the dark, to the darkest skin with the, the intermediate in the middle. All right? And so just to prove to you that, that meiosis really works, that we are mixing up those genes, here's a great example. All right? So these two little girls are famous in all the genetics textbooks. And so they're twins. All right? So their parents are of both um, mixed uh, heritage. So both parents are, have uh, parents that are of European descent and African descent. All right? Both parents. And then when they got together and had kids, they've got a lot of variability in their genes. And the way it played out with their twin daughters, now they're fraternal twins, they're not identical twins. It means they have, it's like they're sisters, right? They don't share the same genes other than the fact that they have the same parents. But one girl has fair skin, blue eyes, and, fair, and light hair. And the other girl has dark eyes, darker skin, and darker hair. But they're sisters from the same parent, born at the same time. 
That's meiosis, mixing up those genes, promoting diversity in the next generation. And this is them as they're, I think this is when they are seven. So again, this stuff really works. So that's polygenic, when you have multiple alleles contributing to the same trait. Right? Now the next thing that we want to look at is called pleiotropy. And pleiotropy is the opposite of polygenic. Whereas polygenic, you have many genes contributing to one characteristic or one trait. Here you have one gene that results in a modification of many traits. And so it's kind of like a domino effect. If that gene is in a crucial kind of physiological process or developmental process, then you're going to see a kind of cascading effect um, from that point. So sickle cell anemia is kind of our example here. So you have one gene mutation, one allele, the sickle cell allele, that causes your cells, your blood cells to sickle, and that creates all kinds of problems down the road, so all kinds of symptoms in the syndrome. And so you have many effects from one gene, and we call that pleiotropy. All right? So, so far, we have looked at Incomplete dominance, codominance, when we have multiple alleles, we've got polygenic inheritance and pleiotropy. You're going to have to review all these things, and we will do problems with each so that you get them down. But there's two more that we want to cover. And the next one is sex-linked genes. And this comes down to the fact that gender um, is determined by the X and Y chromosome on a, on a genetic level, right? So in, in humans, and this isn't the only way to determine gender, there's lots of other ways, mechanisms in nature to determine gender, and um, sometimes it's ploidy, sometimes it's the temperature at which your egg was incubated to determine whether you're male or female, all kinds of stuff. We happen to use this XY system, okay? So if you have the X chromosome and a Y chromosome, not a homologous pair, you actually will uh, develop as a male. If you have two X chromosomes, you develop as a female. So now what you want to note is that mom is homozygous for her sex chromosomes. So if you're female, you have two X chromosomes. If you're male, you're heterozygous, but not even really heterozygous. Because the Y chromosome is a very small chromosome and it doesn't have that many genes on it. It's very, very um, genetically poor in information. Um, so really, as a male, you only have one X chromosome. So it's almost like you're, I mean, you are haploid for that chromosome. And what's going to happen when we talk about sex-linked genes is that basically you lose what's called um, the protection of diploidy. So if you're diploid, this is the whole idea of dominant and recessive. If you have a recessive gene, for example, that is deleterious, that is disease-causing, but you have the other copy of that gene is healthy, you may not, you won't experience the disease. It's protection. It's like an extra slot. But if that gene resides on the X chromosome, if you're male, you lose that protection. If you get the X chromosome with the allele that is deleterious, you will experience that phenotype. You don't have another X chromosome to interact with it. So what we see then is certain traits that are associated with one gender or the other. And fruit flies are kind of the classic example. So this example, they were looking at fruit fly color, and uh, eye color, and this is found on the X chromosome. So again, now we're going to use a new nomenclature, um, still consistent with the previous one, but if someone tells you that a trait is sex-linked, now you know you're dealing with X and Y. All right? And you can't know that unless someone tells you that, right? or you do a bunch of crosses um, to figure it out. But if someone establishes the fact that this now is a sex link trait, you're going to use the chromosomes X and Y as your markers. Right? So in this case, you can see the female on the upper left, she has red eyes. And the allele that she has is a capital R, the dominant, to the allele for white eyes, which is a little r. So she is XX because she's female, big R, big R. So the male, though, is X little r, Y. And the Y has no superscript. There's no letter there. There's no R there because that gene is not on that chromosome. All right? So what happens then is when you cross these, when you do this Punnett square, um, you use the Y as a placeholder 
but then the male, anytime you have the XY, you only get to go with the phenotype of the one gene that you received. All right. So we will play with these more, like I said, as we practice in lab and lecture. But this is the idea behind a sex link trait, that it's on the X chromosome, and males only get one copy of the X chromosome. Now, the final thing that we need to talk about, which is the most complicated, but the most kind of realistic for most of the characteristics that you might think about in humans that you're interested in, and that is called multifactorial inheritance. And this idea is that um, there are environmental considerations that come into play um, and affect gene expression. All right? So the, this picture actually shows you two different uh, flower colors, right? So these are hydrangeas, and you may say, oh, well, look, this is just like we talked about before. There's some plants that are blue, they have the blue gene, some plants that are pink, and they have the pink gene. Well, in fact, I can tell you that this is exactly the same plant. It's the same plant. So it depends on what the pH of the soil that this plant grows in that dictates whether its flowers come out pink or blue. So this is multifactorial inheritance. There's many factors that go into the phenotype that results. So were you, the genes are the same in this plant, and how those genes are responding to soil pH dictates the color that is ultimately produced. All right? So we often refer to this as nurture versus nature. The argument of everything that you are or the characteristics of characteristic of any living thing, is it due to the environment, the conditioning of the environment, how the environment affected how they develop, or is it due to their nature, um, their genes? So nurture being the environment and nature being genetics. This often con comes up with people. It's like, oh, you know, if I had been, um, if I had eaten better food when I was younger, I'd be taller. And that is, in fact, an excellent example. So human height is a multifactorial um, trait and the better nutrition you get early in life when you're developing um, will dictate how um, tall you are. Now there's still a genetic component. So the question then becomes is how much of that is genetic and how much of that is environment. So what we like to talk about is what's called the norm of reaction. And this is the range or the potential range of phenotype that you is established by your genes. Right? So I may have eaten incredibly nutritious food when I was younger and I am 5'9". Um, my two brothers who lived in the same house ate the same food as I did. They're 6'1 and 6'2". We are all probably at the upper end of the norm of reaction for height for us. I just got different genes. right? So again, um, had we not eaten nutritious food when we were younger, neither, none of us may be as tall as we are now, but we're still on that norm. All right, so this is stuff that is um, very interesting and starts to make genetics very, very complex.